Hey everyone, it's Cappy. Wanted to give you a quick heads up that the episode you're about to hear was recorded live at Graduate Evanston Hotel. Big thanks to the graduate team and to Chef Sarah Gruenberg. Enjoy this week's episode. Chef, for our audio test, we like to have chefs name five of something. Okay. So for you, I would like to name five Italian ingredients that every home cook should have in their fridge or pantry. Oh, only five? <laughs> <laughs> Um, that's a well, great- <laughs> if we need to keep testing your audio, we'll do another. Part. No, no. Uh, well, I, I would have to say the staples, uh, Parmigiano Reggiano, a block of that in the fridge. It lasts forever and is so delicious. Um, olive oil, great finishing olive oil, whole peeled canned tomatoes, um, probably some anchovies and uh, balsamic vinegar. Love it. You sound great. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Hey everyone, I'm Cappy and you're listening to Beyond the Plate. I'm a chef by trade and hospitality professional. By day, I head up Rachel Ray's culinary operations and co-founded her cooking and kids charity called Yummo. Five years ago, I had the idea to put together a podcast where we sit down with the world's culinary elite to explore their journey into the food industry and the social impact they have made in their community. Hence, the name Beyond the Plate. If you're new to the pod, welcome. If you listened before, we're so glad you're back. We hope this episode inspires you to cook or, like the chefs we feature, make a difference in your community. And we're grateful to our partners who make this podcast a reality. With that, this episode is brought to you by our friends at Graduate Hotels. One of Graduate's U.S. locations happens to be where this live episode was recorded. It's right outside of Chicago in Evanston, to be exact, and steps away from Northwestern University. This hotel is such a gem, everybody. I got to geek out for a minute. They have this Home Alone suite in the hotel, which launched in 2020. It was timed with the movie's 30th anniversary. So this room at the hotel mimics the McAllister master bedroom, and it features different references from the movie. It has Kevin's workstation. They have this cool retro TV. I got to tour this room already, by the way. And you get little Nero's cheese pizza. I love it. It's amazing. They have a Marshall Fields bag in the room. You get pajamas when you stay there. It's cool. I wish this was actually on video so I could make my Kevin McAllister face right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I, uh, I love that. And I know we love all these special rooms they have at all their hotels. But another room, tell everyone about the Homestead Room. Yes, Homestead Room is the restaurant at Graduate Evanston. The name is a tribute to the former moniker, the Homestead. They have this refreshed menu that they did, which is really cool. They have different takes on classic American dishes and flavors and They have a great cocktail menu created by the acclaimed beverage consultant, Bad Birdie. Um, But this restaurant has some serious history with a a lineup of incredible chefs that have come through the physical space from Michael Carlson, who was at Schwa, Grant Ackett's from Alinea, Rick Tremonto, Curtis Duffy. So a whole handful of them, A a lot of history in that building there. And generally speaking, each graduate hotel has this unique design inspired by its local college, various campus legends and the town's history. And last and certainly not least, props to our friends at Graduate as they become incredible partners to the communities they're located in, holding food drives, hosting holiday events, donating proceeds of happenings to local charities and providing meaningful career opportunities to both students and locals. If you want to learn more about Graduate Hotels, go to graduatehotels.com and follow them on Instagram at Graduate Hotels. Graduate, we thank you. One more thing. We have some awesome Beyond the Plate merch. You can find a link in your podcast player or go to our website, beyondtheplatepodcast.com. Head on over and check out our hats, tees, hoodies, and more. Again, that's beyondtheplatepodcast.com. Enjoy this week's episode. All right, let's do it. This evening's guest is chef partner of Monteverde Restaurant and Pasificio in Chicago's West Loop. She's originally from Houston, Sugarland to be exact, yes. and grew up cooking with her grandparents on their ranch in Victoria, Texas. She moved to Chicago in 2005 and joined the team at Spiaggia under the leadership of chef Tony Montuano. She started as a line cook, quickly rose the ranks to chef de cucina, and then executive chef. As executive chef, Spiaggia was awarded one Michelin star for three consecutive years. You've likely watched her as a competitor and finalist on Bravo's Top Chef Texas and Food Network's Iron Chef Gauntlet. In fall of 2022, she published her first cookbook, Listen to Your Vegetables. Please enjoy this episode as we go beyond the plate with a woman who Gail Simmons of Top Chef says, quietly dominates all she does. (laughs) 
She's she so nice. is Chef Sarah Grunberg. Thank you. <laughs> um, this is an honor to be here. Thank you. <laughs> Do you want to know what else Gail said about you? Sure. All right. Um, she said, your food is outstanding and consistently delicious. And she's proud to have had a courtside seat to your success all these years. She's great. It's quite the compliment. It really is. How do you deal with compliments? Well, they're hard, right? I think for everybody to even, um, but it's, a, it's just, it's a real reward to see joy, you know, and, and to, to create joy for people. And that's, I think, why I'm a, I'm a chef, because I love to feed. I love to take care of people. I love to bring you in and, and, you know, show you hospitality, I guess, yeah. which is uh, just, a, it's a real human factor that I think we all need and want and missed for several years yeah, recently. Seriously. Um, well, I've got another compliment for you and I need to say this because we've sat with many different types of chefs and personalities. And one thing I, co I constantly say about you when someone's like, how's Sarah's food? I always say you go the extra mile. Um, and here's what I mean. Like if anyone's been at an event where Sarah's serving food, it could be a bite of something. Her food is always like the best in the room. Like some people are like, oh, let's just do this dish for that event. Like she puts like so much thought into it and I think it pays back a ton. Thank you. So yeah, it's incredible. Um, all right, we often like to start by having our guests paint a picture of themselves as a kid because that helps, you know, see who they are as an adult, their future. So take us back to Sugarland, Texas in the 80s. Oh man. Well, um, I was uh, raised by a single mom and an only child, so I entertained myself a lot and, yeah. and started cooking a lot. Even at the age of like eight, I was watching um, all the PBS cooking shows and um, starting to play around with food. I, I really loved Barbies, I loved to build things, to kind of, I would design menus. Um, How funny. And even in fourth grade, I started a restaurant, uh, my fourth grade class. Did you name it? I, we did, yeah, it's a real, it's. Bring it. <laughs> okay, uh, it was called a Taste of the World, and it was inspired by a box, a little pack of stickers I got at the grocery store with my mom. And on the stickers had all these little kids from different countries and saying hello in their yeah. language. So I thought, well, I'm going to create a restaurant that if you didn't know where you wanted to eat, you know, and maybe somebody wants German or French or African or um, Italian. It, basically, the menu was divided by different countries and had the little stickers of the kids. But I, I took it a step further. We did this during recess um, and the bleachers were the kitchen and some, some of my friends in school would be the servers, some would be the diners, some would be in the kitchen and we created bunny, cut, like cardboard coins, menus, like a whole, it's amazing. a whole like little mini, ma like make believe restaurant. I love it. Um, did you have family dinners growing up? I know you said you were raised by a single mother. Yeah. But. So, you know, I, when I was with my grandparents and my family, absolutely. But I think my mom, she did a lot for me to not mm -hmm. need to, or not feel the need to need something. And so she worked really hard and part of her job was traveling. And so I had throughout my childhood, several people who I would go and stay with oh. while she had to travel. And so as a kid, you know, that might seem that was, I didn't realize it was different. I thought it was normal to be at different places all the time. But what happened was, is I, I would eat different foods. And so I think as a child, you only really eat what your core family dishes are. And so then, you know, I would say one woman, uh, her name was Wilma, Wilma and Jack Dergay. She was from Mississippi. So she cooked like these amazing different dishes from Mississippi. And then uh, Jack and Sherry, they were another couple that took care of me. They were, um, she was from Savannah, Georgia. So, you know, there was these like different, you know, I didn't realize it at the time, but I was starting to chronicle these food memories or experiences. You know, I like to think of chefs, our brains are kind of like these libraries and you can go back and pinpoint. Yeah. Um, and it could be something super silly, like a, the way a pizza topping is on a pizza, but I remember those things vividly as a child. Got it. So. I love that. Um, I actually had a lovely conversation with your mom this oh, weekend. Oh man. <laughs> and a text thread last night. I mean, <laughs> Trish was 
like bringing all the goods. Uh, oh um, man. I'm and, terrified. And I heard somebody scream. <laughs> uh, you should be. No, we, call her, we call her uh, Trish the Dish. Trish the Dish is incredible. Um, so raising She you, is incredible. Yeah. Raising you as a single parent. Yes. Tell us about like her impact on your work. Well, her impact and even my family, like my grandparents and my mom, we all, we all like just we're a working family. So like if you weren't working, then what were you doing? You know, it's mm. kind of like even my grandparents, they worked, but then they had a garden and raised cattle and made bread. Like everything you made something, you didn't just, you know, they, they weren't raised by grocery stores. They were raised more by like, you have to actually, if you want something, you have to like actually raise it oh, <laughs> or, or hunt. Um, and so, um, but my mom, she taught me, she's a great role model for a young girl because, um, you know, I've, I've made my career something really important to me. And I think through her drive, she was, um, a regional nurse for a home health company. And so she would travel and do that. And now she's, she's, uh, trying to get her to retire. So hopefully I won't, I'll retire before she will. <laughs> I tried to get on the phone with her at like nine o'clock on Friday. She's like, I'm still at work. I'm like. She you works a trish. lot. I, yeah. It's, I don't know. I think it's like one of those things. Yeah, I love that. Um, do you remember the first dish you ever cooked? Well, yeah, it's macaroni and cheese. And it wasn't like there was the box one, but then I like I graduated and actually started to put like milk and Velveeta and stir it. Yeah. And make like an actual sauce or what I thought was a sauce. <laughs> <laughs> Tell but, me about this chicken fried steak dinner. Oh yes. The chicken fried steak. So, um, <laughs> because my grandfather raised cattle, basically I grew up with a deep freezer full of meat all wrapped in white butcher paper with different cuts and name, like the stamp of the name of the cut. And so, um, there was lots of cuts that I didn't, you would never really see at the grocery store, but, um, a, a lot of cuts that they didn't know what to do. They would just kind of make into what they call cutlets. So it would just be kind of like a tenderized thin piece of meat. And so, um, that you fried those. So we would dip them in flour and I'd wash and fry them. And uh, my uncle was a big part of my life when I was in, he came and lived with us when I was in fourth grade. And so him and I would make this dish together and I would make the macaroni and cheese that, that was the side dish. Got it. Got it. Um, what three words would you use to describe yourself as a kid? Oh man. Um, I would say, Oh, I don't know. Three words. Um, ex I was, I think it was excited. I, you know, creative. Um, and I don't know, maybe shy, but not shy at the same time, you know, like a little guarded, but. Ooh, I asked your mom. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, what three do you think she said? I don't know. I think she'd probably say that I was really creative and like would, would entertain myself for hours. So just a, a, lots of imagination. She said loving. She said social. And she said creative. Nice. Yeah. Um, so you went to the Art Institute of Houston? I did. What did you study? Culinary arts. You did? Yes. Love that. Um, Right out of high school. So right I was. Out of high school. Okay, so right out of high school, you went to Art Institute of Houston. Yes. Studied culinary arts. Yes. And then your first job was at was, Brennan's. Was at Brennan's. Well, it was really at Party City, but I think I got fired. <laughs> <laughs> Why? How do you get fired from Party City? I, I don't. I, I don't. I don't think I was a model employee. <laughs> oh, okay. um, I didn't like to clean up the toy aisle, whatever that aisle is where they put all the little. I yeah. don't know. No, I don't remember. <laughs> but yes, Brennan's of Houston. Okay, so you call this your career-changing job um, under the incredible chef Chris Shepard, if yes. anyone's familiar in Houston. Yes. Um, how did it feel walking into that first day oh, terrifying. Like, in a new kitchen? Like, what's going through your head? Yeah, my throat is, like, up here now. Um, 
cooking really saved me. And I didn't know as a child that you could be a chef. Like there wasn't like a lot of chef role models. Um, but Food Network, when it came out when I was about 12, that's when I was like, whoa. And, you know, mm. we're, we kind of talked about that a little bit. But Emerald, I mean, a lot of those chefs, Bobby Flay, he had the grilling and chilling. I don't know if you remember where the guy cooked on the smoker and the yeah. gas grill. But um, at that point, I started to realize that you could be a chef. And so culinary school really saved my life because I don't think I was going to make it much for like I really yeah. needed to do something. Yeah, it was a, it was hard being a, a teenager and and stuff like that. And so um I was at culinary school and it just felt like I was at the right place. Like you ever know when you just know you're at the right place, you're like this is 150% where I should be right now. And so um I, it was like a year into the school and Chris Shepard came in and he had a long ponytail and and he had um, a long ponytail that he would put underneath his chef toque. So if you know him now, you would never think that he would have a long ponytail. Yeah. Um, and he came in and he kind of like got down and he was like, who wants a job? And then I shot my hand up and he was like, who else wants a job? <laughs> <laughs> and so I was like, I really want a job with you. And so he's like, all right, great. Call this number at three o'clock. So, okay, I'm ready. I got my phone number. I'm going to call 3 o'clock. Well, anyone knows 3 o'clock is the shift change from lunch to dinner. It's when pe there's no one on the phones then. That's like the time that you don't tell somebody to call. <laughs> and so I would call three, four days in a row, no answer, or Chris isn't here. So then I just drove up there. And nice. I remember parking behind the restaurant, and I walked through what is, what is this big door with a fan to keep the flies from coming in. And I walk in and he's standing there and he looks at me and the other chef looked at him and he goes, she's yours. And so that basically meant like if they were going to hire me, take a chance on me, that Chris was then my mentor. Like they would, you know, switch. Yeah. And so basically if I didn't do well, he would be the one that would have to let me go also. Mm. Interesting. But yeah, so that's kind of how it was. It's what, okay, so, well, the interesting part of this story is a couple of the other female chefs we spoke to, we, we talked to Chef Alex Guarnaschelli a while ago, and she became a very young sous chef at a Michelin-starred restaurant in France. And when I was talking to her, I was like, how did that feel? She's like, pardon my French, everybody. It's fucking hard, you know? And Brooke Williamson, yeah. another chef, she was a chef of Michael's in Santa Monica when she was 19 years old. Yeah. Not easy stuff. So in 2003, you were now named Brennan's youngest female sous yes, chef. Yes, yes. So what did that mean to you, going from that story you just told to that? Well, Chris was an incredible mentor. And so I'm so glad that at that point that I was the one that, that was going to be under his wing. Because, you know, I, I learned a lot. And I remember, like, just day-to-day -day struggles. I mean, the to teach herself how to cook over and over again, have the consistency, have the discipline. You can't plan how service is going to go. Tickets are going to come whenever they want, what they're going to order. It, it, there's no planning. You just have to like be ready to take it. Um, and so uh, Chris was great and, and we had a great, we had a really good time. The thing that was so interesting about Brennan's is they had a kitchen table and the chef, the cooks could create dishes from for the chef's table. So it was a seven course meal and the salad station was responsible for making the first course. And you could choose a dish from the menu or you could go on a limb and make your own dish. And so Chris started to help nurture me into that. Mm. And ultimately getting over that hump of starting to create food was when then the sky was the limit. It was like, oh my gosh, I'm on it. And I was sous chef by 22. Wow. Yeah. What do you wish you would have known then that you know now? That everyone else is just as scared as you are in anything that you do. Yeah. That everyone else has the same, not the same insecurity, but that everyone deals with some level of doubt. Yeah. And that it's okay. Like, use that as a push versus, yeah. you know, the, the mental, like, you're not good enough thing. Yeah, I like that. Um, okay, so in 2005, we get you and you moved to Chicago. What was your oh, goal man. or dream? Did you have a dream in moving to Chicago? Well, Chicago was big time. Like okay. 
I was stepping into the real restaurant city now. That's how it felt. And um, Spiaggia was hard. It was hard and it was beautiful. I mean, stunning. Like, imagine being 24, like just going up that escalator to this grand marble, you know, you walk out and there's the Lake Michigan. It was just insanity. Um, and I'm so glad that I went there and did that. It was, you know, part of my moving to Chicago involved several stages. So I would fly up, stay with a friend on a friend's couch, stage in a few restaurants. And then my last day, Missy said that I could do an interview. So I interviewed with her and she said, come on back. Um, and so then I flew back up again a second time and did a two-day stage. And then she offered me a job. And I called my mom. I said, Mom, I got a job. And then she started crying. And then she flew up the next day. And then we found an apartment in the Gold Coast. I love that. <laughs> so Spiaggi was Tony Montuano. The sous chef there was Missy Robbins. Missy Robbins now has Lilia and Missy in New yes. York. If anyone's going to New York and wants a good Italian restaurant. Yes, she's incredible. Yeah. Um, you said you were out of your league at Spiaggia. I was. Why? I mean, Brennan's was like Southern Texas Creole. I mean, the sauce, the sauce yeah. work in that style of cuisine, the seafood, the, you know, using roux. It was like more of a traditional French style of cooking. And then I, I went there and it was making carne cruda and, and carpaccio and these langoustines that you had to peel. I'd never seen a langoustine before and peel a langoustine and then butter poach them and serve them with green beans and coriander. <laughs> and olive oil Yum. was the sauce. Oh, <laughs> and I it mean, was like, what? Yeah. How, is, how is olive oil the sauce? And then I quickly would sneak little tastes to understand what that meant with the olive oil on it. And it was like, whoa, it was life changing. As a cook, did you ever want to throw in the towel? Oh, yes. What kept you going? I don't know. At one point when I was at Spiaggia, I considered maybe going to work for Southwest Airlines as a flight attendant. Uh, fun fact, Sarah had a companion pass when she was four years old because she flew so much. I did because my mom would bring me along on all of her work trips. Um, that is one thing I think as a child, I spent a lot of time with adults. And mm. so the people who took care of me or my mom would take me to a work trip and, you know, it, it it made me, I think, confident to, to be around adults more. And so moving to Chicago and being in that kitchen and being like, it was like my time to kind of step up and, and become an adult in a way. She, you, she also called you an old soul, but yeah. I cut her off at three descriptors. So, but that was like the fourth. Yeah, we, <laughs> that's a rabbit hole. We don't want to go down. No, I'm joking. Um, yes, yes. So... Um, were you given any piece of advice that helped you through those tough times? I don't know. I think I just knew I had to keep trying. Mm. I just knew that it's hard to move somewhere. You don't know anybody and you're, you're from Texas. I mean, I thought that every state had a Texas, like an Illinois edition truck. You know what I mean? <laughs> like when you are raised in Texas, it's like a real identity thing. It's crazy. Uh, and then moving here, I was like, whoa, wait a second. No, you mean you guys don't love Illinois all the time? <laughs> Il like Illinois everything? Because where I'm from, <laughs> we make Texas edition everything. <laughs> Um, and so, uh, that was, you know, fun, but, uh, I think I remember it all happens for a reason because it's like, a, there's missing puzzle pieces, right? So once you then kind of get a friend group or a, a, a support group around you, then those challenges of your day to day things become easier, right? I think it's like, it took like a year to like start to develop like a real relationship with people, you know, and learn and, and meet people. Because if not, kitchens are competitive. And so the reality is, is all of us were competing for one or two roles and, and wanted to be, you know, you never wanted to be the issue that night during service. You wanted to be the, the best that you could be. So, um, but I, I think that Top Chef taught me 
the best advice I was given when I went to prepare to do that was that like, you have to really learn how to dig deep inside, like Hmm. that there's so much more that's actually possible. If you like really try to ground yourself and like, remember like why you want, like why you're doing that. Yeah. How did that happen? Did someone like talk you into auditioning Top Chef? Tony did. Well, he did Top Chef Masters and loved it and was like, oh my God, we became such great friends with all the chefs. And I had my phone, we went to dinner. Well, the regular Top Chef is way different. (laughs) You're like, you know, locked up. Yeah, 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 yeah. no phone. And so, um, but I'm so glad I did it. It was really hard, but really rewarding and really helped give me the confidence. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't have Monteverde now, I think, if I hadn't done that. Interesting. Um, okay, you've traveled throughout Italy, Asia, Europe, the U.S., which inspires your approach to food and understanding dishes, um, how they were created, where they come from. I have a question. Okay. Um, what inspired you to have a walk in an Italian restaurant? So... Sarah has a walk in her Italian we, restaurant. We do. <laughs> We do have a whole walk station, which uh, it sadly hasn't been opened yet since COVID because we are still trying to get our staffing. Like we're so close. Mm. Um, so right now it's just this middle station that got it has stuff stored on it. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, our goal is to open it in the next few uh, months. Uh, Chef Bailey and I said, we're going to do it February 1st. Um, That's coming very soon. So probably March 1st. (laughs) But um, so to understand the walk is to think of it as an actual ingredient. So um, Bill Kim was such a great friend and it happened just going to Urban Belly, the one that was in the strip center, you know, like the original Urban Belly. And we would go there and just talk for hours about noodles and pasta and the connection and, you know, how did noodles kind of go through the spice route and what does that look like from people of different areas and how they get that dough and then what it happens to and how does the sauce change. And so he was really inspired of taking Italian ways into his style of Korean noodles. And then I was becoming inspired of how to use things that he was teaching me, making his noodles into uh, pasta. And so when I trained in Italy and became good friends with um, some really key uh, people, Andrea Bezzecchi's one, he's a balsamic maker. He's like one of my best friends, but he... They taught me when I was there that, you know, when they come here, Italian food has too many stuff, too much stuff on it. Like it's not simple. Oh, here. Okay. Got it. Here. And so to think, but they were like, you know, so when I was in Italy, I learned how to make things very traditionally and then came back and tried to recreate those same traditional dishes. And then they were like, no, but Sarah, you're American. So like break the rules a little bit, do something different. So then I started to think with these conversations I was having with Bill Kim and my Italian friends giving me the right to say, you can play with our cuisine a little bit. You know, it doesn't have to be so traditional. Those two things coming together. um, And so the walk is really an ingredient of flavor uh, because if you can cook a tomato sauce and pasta in a wok, it just, it caramelizes, the flavor intensifies, the oil, like every tomato product needs to be like, I call it fried, like frying the tomato. So frito or anything like that, you want to, you don't want to just dump tomato sauce in a cold pot. You got to get oil in there and you got to heat it up and you got to put the tomato and let it sizzle. It doesn't matter what you're doing. So the wok does that. And then it's been really fun to to explore and, and try new recipes. But even putting pasta in a wok first and stir frying the pasta and then hitting sauce changes it, but it's not like another ingredient, huh. right? Yeah. It's like the Italians are like, we come here and there's too much stuff on the plate, but if you can make a pomodoro and a wok, you still only have olive oil, garlic, tomato, pasta, basil. But if it's in a wok, now that wok is an ingredient, but it's not another Different flavor. Correct. So hungry. (laughs) (laughs) So. Um, Long-winded answer, but that's. I love it. (laughs) Um, Is the Monteverde restaurant that we see today the one that you and your business partners envisioned? 
before it opened in 2015? Oh man, no way. We had like way less tables. We, um, I was just hoping that people would like, like it, you know, that they would come in and give us a chance. And I don't remember how many tables did we have? How many did we have before Jim? It was like 60 or something. And now, and now we're at a hundred and Jeez. yeah, because, because we quickly realized that a, in order people like it, that and <laughs> to pay the bills, we need to pay more seats, uh, young chefs everywhere. Like, I just want to own this small restaurant and do a small restaurant. And I totally get it. But the reality is the finances in a small restaurant are really challenging. Yeah like beyond challenging. And so, you know, there's a threshold. You want to be, you want to push the boundary of how busy you can be with that core group that you have. You know, don't be in the bottom part of that threshold. You really got to try to operate at the, hmm. to take advantage of the, um, like it. the team that's there. But, but Monte Verde is so beautiful and absolutely everything I've wanted it to be. But it's, it's I walk in that restaurant especially if it's like we're open and I'm like, what is going on? And like, how did this happen? <laughs> and That's it good. smells so good when you walk in from the outside. If you're there all day, you're used to the smell. Right. But if I do an event and come back and walk in the restaurant, I'm like, oh, this place smells insane. <laughs> That's great. Which That's is good. part of that whole feeling, that whole, like, again, me wanting to nurture and feed and welcome and take care of you. Yeah. Well, it feels like that when you eat there. Uh, Monteverde has gone on to achieve, I'll just rattle off a few accolades. Uh, Three-star review from the Chicago Tribune, 2016 named one of Food & Wine's America's Best New Restaurants, Top 50 finalists in Bon Appetit Best New Restaurant, GQ's 12 Best New Restaurants, and if that wasn't enough, in 2017, you received the James Beard Foundation Award for Best Chef in the Great Lakes, and you were a semifinalist for the Best Chef in the Country, in 2019 and 2020. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, when did you realize you made it as a chef? Oh, man. Probably when I won the James Street Award. Yeah? Probably. That was... I had gone... So Spiaggia was nominated multiple times for Outstanding Service, Outstanding Restaurant. Tony had already won, but we would all travel and go to the Beard Awards in New York when they were in New York. So, you know, you go, you sit in that room for the first time and you see all of these people that you've looked up to your whole career in one place and it feels kind of bonkers and um, thank gosh that happened to me. And so, mm. I, I mean, I would say that's when it felt like I didn't have to worry about who Sarah was anymore. I could just help Sarah be Sarah, <laughs> you know, like, like you're good. Okay. So let's just now work on other things and building a team around you. And that's, that takes a lot. Hmm. I think. I like it. Um, what was the last restaurant outside of Chicago where the experience or food stopped you in your tracks? Uh, most recently we were at birdies in Austin and it's great. And it's a husband and wife team. Um, they just had a baby. And uh, um, it's a great restaurant. They had their baby with them, clearing tables. Like, it. it was just a whole family thing. Um, they've re-kind of thought of how to do high-end uh, fine dining because it's counter service. But the wine list is, like, incredible. And mm. the food is beyond incredible. So people will wait in line and the order. And what they've been able to do is figure out how to pace the kitchen with the guests coming in. That's the biggest challenge in a restaurant is pacing. Think of it like traffic jam. That's what happens in a kitchen or in a bar when you seat too many people at once. And so what they've figured out is how to have service that um, is paced by it takes three minutes to take an order and do the transaction. So mm. then that's how it paces the kitchen. Interesting. And the food is delicious. How about in Chicago? Oh, in Chicago. Where did I eat most recently? Um, gosh. Where did we go over the break? Oh, we went to uh, Club Lucky, which I love. because <laughs> It's like, it just oh, makes my, me so happy. My wife is smiling ear to ear right now. <laughs> Um, That's but so funny. What do you get there? Maybe I need to try a new dish. So 
the sleeper hit is the escarole with broth and beans. That's a side dish. You definitely want to get that. Okay. Um, and you get a salad with the meatball. Put the meatball on the salad. That's a good move. And I think the linguine and clams. That's one That's of the, all you need. Yeah. Those okay, three fine. things. Maybe I should stick with what I, uh, <laughs> what I know. <laughs> Um, love it. All but it's right. just the way it makes you feel, that restaurant, too. Hey, everyone. Just give us a quick moment for a shout out to one of our Beyond the Play podcast partners. All right, everyone. I want to take a quick second to give some love to our friends at Ford's Gin. If you're like me and you enjoy a good gin and tonic or a Negroni, or maybe you're a martini person, seeing a bunch of different gin bottles at a bar, restaurant, or liquor store can be a little daunting. Ford's Gin was crafted by bartenders for bartenders and at-home bartenders alike to make a really, really good gin cocktail. Simon Ford noticed bartenders had various go-to gins for different classic gin cocktails and thought, why not make a gin that bartenders could use that would work perfectly in all of these drinks while keeping it at an accessible price? Thank you, Simon Ford. Ford's Gin, by the way, uses a mix of nine botanicals, starting with the traditional base of juniper and coriander seed, and then they balance it out with some citrus and florals like jasmine and different spices. It's quite delicious. Actually, funny story, and then I want to get back to this episode. Last weekend was at a get-together, and the guy there who I'd given a bottle of Ford's Gin to came right over to me and thanked me for the bottle because he's like, it makes the perfect Negroni. Perfect. And he had him uh, like a... Big batch made and everyone at the party was just loving it. But back to this episode, I'm loving it. And the best part, yeah, great one. Hang around after the episode because before we did this live recording, you did a Beyond the Drink, a special one right there. I can't wait to hear it at the end of this episode. All right, everyone, let's raise our glass and cheers to Ford's for their sense of giving back to the bartending community as well. They've also supported events and fundraisers, but overall, they always have the bartending community in mind. To learn more about Ford's Gin, go to FordsGin.com and follow them on social media at Ford's Gin. Please drink responsibly. Ford's London Dry Gin, 45% ABV, Brown Foreman, Louisville, Kentucky. Ford's Gin is a registered trademark. Ford's Gin, we thank you. Back to this week's episode. This book of yours. Yes. Um, we mentioned Chris Shepard earlier. Um, tell us the story of him and you and the walk-in refrigerator. Yes. Okay. So um, this goes back to the the um, idea of that kitchen table experience and being a young cook and, and creating. So I was on saute station and I, I wanted to do the fish course for the table. And um, I was like, you know, I had the snapper. I don't know what to do with it. And he was like, come on, let's go in the cooler. Let's see what's talking to you. <laughs> and that like totally stopped me in my tracks. That experience was like, wait a second, <laughs> we're going to go on the walk-in and listen to see what's talking to us. Like, that's <laughs> amazing. And, um, it really is. And so, so it's funny. true because things do talk to you and they happen and you don't even realize it. We're all so busy everywhere. So I found myself in front of this big bucket of beets. Now this was pre beet salad rampage of the early 2000s sure. this was um it hadn't hit houston i guess i should say and so i roasted the beets and did this dish wouldn't even make it at a restaurant <laughs> i can't believe it. <laughs> so bad but i roasted the beets and i did like a really nice dice like a medium dice and then i did apple and so what happened when you cook the beets with the apple with a little butter then the shades of the red like kind of tinted the apple so then they were like a rosy pink and i think i did like swiss chard and the snapper and verblanc sauce like but it was so different visually than anything we had done at brennan's because mm. brennan's was much more like the sauce and the fish and, and this was like a lighter i guess approach and so yeah those beets and apple ended up going on a quail dish that that is in the second cookbook for the restaurant. Got it. All right. So this first book, listen to your vegetables. Yeah. Um, what are vegetables trying to tell us? Oh my gosh they they want you to celebrate all of them and for all of their unique traits. And so. Listen to your vegetables is something that happens when you go to the store, when you are at the market, when you open your refrigerator and you look in that bottom drawer like it changed from the last time you looked <laughs> at it, but it didn't. But maybe, maybe the scallions or the cabbage is like, hey, 
don't let me sit in here. <laughs> um, it has a lot of different meanings. I mean, when you when I went to the store, um, right when COVID, when it was like everyone was buying everything and it went to the produce section and everything was gone except like rutabagas, turnips, squashes. And I thought I could feel those veggies pain. They were like, no one wanted us. No one wanted to take us home. They're like, I got you. I Everyone got you. grabbed the lettuce and the plastic <laughs> container. <laughs> like that whole thing was empty, but not the, and so this I think goes into like my childhood and playing and being imaginative. And so I hear the vegetables and then I hear, I hear what they, it's going to sound crazy. It sounds crazy, I know, but it's it's about. I'm just thinking of this half a head of cabbage I had at, at home right now, and yeah, what it's trying to tell me. Cabbage Cook is me like already. Damn so it. so so that's one part of it, and the second part was we were traveling so much. Jamie and I were traveling a lot, and we do travel quite a bit. Um, and I was ordering, we were ordering a lot of takeout and after a while it's fun at first, but then like it starts to weigh on you, right? You're like, I really need to get more veggies and da, da, da. So then when I go to the grocery store, I would start to just buy a few things like what, and I call those my fridge warriors in the book. So like the cabbages, the cauliflower, the celery, those things can go in your fridge drawer and be good for weeks. So even if you've been traveling, you come home, you're like, I don't have anything to cook. You actually do because you bought that cabbage and it's yeah. in your drawer <laughs> and you can make something amazing. You can make spaghetti with cabbage and Parmigiano and delicious. Yeah. So um, that's kind of that. And I think also as a chef and Italians do it so well is they really think about how to extract flavor or enhance the flavor of said vegetable, which is why when you go to Italy and you have a zucchini, you're like, why is this zucchini the best zucchini I've ever had? Why is this tomato the best I've ever had? And it's not necessarily, I mean, the quality of product for sure is amazing, but I think it's just the care, the touch, the hand. Um, you know, mm. Bill Kim always taught me that like the hand of, of like who's kimchi, like it, it's not, it's not like the same recipe. It's the flavor of the hand that makes it. And so I think a lot of us have this, like, how how I cook something, it'll have my hand, if that makes sense. Like, my style. I just am thinking of, like, matzo balls. Exactly. It's totally the same thing. Like, <laughs> different. It could be the same recipe, but the hand is different. Yeah. And then it's just something a little different that happens. So, Listen to Your Vegetables is a book about veggies, but not just vegetarian um, recipes. There's a lot of vegetarian recipes, but it's really to inspire, I hope, people to run out to the store and get a few veggies that maybe you don't always put in your cart. Uh, because I think by creatures of habit, we buy the same things every time we go, especially if you're family, if you're busy working, like you don't, you know, you're going to buy your same like things yeah. that you know you can actually execute. Yeah with your time constraints and things like that. And so that's also, you know, I, I want, I want to inspire people to look at the different types of potatoes and, you know, we all walk by them, but what are, what's, ha that's a large amount of potatoes sometimes, different colors and flavors. And so, yeah, it's, I encourage all everybody of my friends. to pick this book is like crazy, beautiful. <laughs> it's you. so well written. As I was saying, Sarah goes the extra mile. This book is like, it's a beautiful coffee table book, but then it's going to get really dirty because you're going to bring it in the kitchen and cook from it. People have been cooking out of the book so much. And it's at first it was the one thing that I didn't realize I, that would happen. I don't know what I thought people were going to do <laughs> when they took it home. But I was like, oh, wait, you're actually making that <laughs> recipe. And then in my head, I'm like, oh, my God, I hope it turned out OK. And then like. You know, and so it's it's funny because it's, I want to be there to help people cook, but then that's why we wrote the recipe. And, and my co-writer Kate Headings is amazing, and she helped me so much. Um, she works with Food and Wine magazine, so she understood a lot of the ways a recipe could be confusing for a home cook, and mm. and so she helped really make sure that all the recipe, you know, every every like if I say to saute an onion for five minutes or until this happens. Because the reality is all of our pans are different. All of our stoves are different. The onions are different. A chopped onion might be one thing to you or to my mom, it's like big chunks. Like, do you know what I mean? It, it all, it's not all the same. It's all relative to your hand. Sure. 
in a way. And so, um, yeah. Uh, If we were to cook one recipe from Listen to Your Vegetables, what would it be? Oh, man. Uh, Well, Jamie's fermento cheese. No. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I think one of the pestos. There's... Hmm an amazing amount of pesto. My, one of our favorite recipes in the book that we cook a lot is the kale pesto, the Tuscan kale pesto with walnuts and bucatini pasta. Um, but, uh, pesto is something that I think is challenging and seems scary, but then if you learn how to make pesto, then it's like, it, it's like a flavor bomb. It mm. is just a way for you to get so much flavor, texture, acidity, sweetness, umami, cheese, which, whichever pesto you're making. And it's just right there for you to put on anything. So okay. if you just make like a pumpkin, I have a pumpkin seed pesto, there's a tomato almond pesto, there's of course r- traditional basil pesto. Um, but yeah. yeah, all right, pesto it is. Um, All right. I want to talk a little bit about social impact and giving back. One of the reasons we started the podcast was to shine a light on on the good chefs do in their community, and they all do it in different ways. And I'm sure a lot of people in this room can attest that uh, chefs get asked, they could probably do 15 different events every single week, um, but you know, they only have so much time on their hands. We were just talking about all the events. You were? Yeah, exactly. (laughs) The crossover. Um, So it's one of the things that keeps us as a team on the podcast going. It's, it's pretty inspiring. And we get quite a few notes from people in and out of the industry saying they heard someone talking about a certain organization. But um, with that said, I wanted to give you a moment to shine a light on a certain cause or organization that you um, work with or have worked with. Well, I would say Southern Smoke um, is such a huge one. And that was um, special to me because it's uh, from Houston, but founded by Chris Shepard and started as a as a way to raise money um, for MS, a friend of ours had MS or has MS, and so um, it was a way for Chris to start doing like some just overall awareness. And then Harvey hit Houston and completely wiped out like the entire city and displaced so many workers in the restaurant industry and. It took them several months to rebuild. And so he realized there was no emergency fund for people in the restaurant industry. And so Southern Smoke has also now become a big part of supporting people in the industry and and not just chefs or servers, delivery drivers, wine uh, reps, um, bar dishwashers, farmers, meat purveyor, like any step of the way to getting to us here in this room, if you've been a part of that, then you are eligible to to get support when needed. And um, their goal is to have uh, free mental health coverage for anyone in the food service industry in the next few years. Um, but anytime there's a disaster, um, they're there trying to help make sure people can, I mean, they'll, they'll give you a check for rent, for yeah. bills, like no kinds of questions asked. The, um, you know, they do have, you do have to show that you've been in the industry, I think it's six months. Hmm. But even we've had employees at our restaurant utilize it and it's been very helpful. Yeah. And so. It's an incredible organization. Yeah. And for those of you listening, we will link to Southern Smoke in the episode notes of the podcast player that you're listening on right now. Um, And I always like to follow this up, and I've said it 500 times, um, give what you can. You can use your voice. You can use your dollars. You can use your time. Some people think they have to write a huge check. You don't. One dollar, five dollars goes a long way for certain organizations. Mm -hmm. Donating 30 minutes of time a month goes a long way for organizations and using your voice. You could have 100 followers on Twitter or 100,000 and a simple tweet, Instagram, TikTok, whatever, highlighting a cause um, can make a difference for a lot of people. So thanks for all the work you do in Southern Smoke. Um, We want to do a quick speed round and then we'll open it up to Q&A. If anyone has any questions, we'll take a few questions and then we'll close it out. Number one, 
What did you have for dinner last night? Chili. I had chili for dinner last you night. You did? How funny. Oh my God, we had chili mac and it was so good. <laughs> uh, I may or may not have made macaroni pasta, you know. Just boil it and put it, it's like. That's so funny. Weird. Great. Anyway. It was um, like seven yeah. degrees. Everyone made chili yeah. last night. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's like, me too, me too, me too. Uh, name no a beans. There yeah. wasn't beans in my chili. But. <laughs> name a smell in the kitchen you love. Mm, garlic frying. Name a smell in the kitchen you hate. Grease trap. What pisses you off in the kitchen? Oh, um, I would say the mindset that someone else is going to do something versus like just handling it in the moment. So like if you mm. walk, like if something's on the ground, pick it up. Like, Got it. Be, uh, like, be responsible for yourself. Yeah. What makes you happy in the kitchen? Oh, man. When anything is working well. I mean, I would say there's so many great things. But when the food is coming out, when it's busy, when the energy is there, it's like being in a concert. Yeah. Um, if they open a graduate Houston and there's a Sarah Groomberg themed room. Oh. What would be in that room? Oh, man. I don't know. I, I, ultimate, I, I first thought about a bunch of posters, <laughs> like my childhood home. <laughs> but um, I don't know. There would be lots of cats. No, not lots of cats. <laughs> but but um, there would be, I would say, like some real loungy, very comfortable loungy thing. And maybe there's like a piece of prosciutto. You could walk up and oh, cut a little that. piece if you want. And oh, yeah. A martini cart. Sold. I'm booking a room. Um, all right, Q and A time for the audience. If anyone has any questions, feel free to shout it out, and then I'm going to repeat it. Um, you may go first. Carly is asking if there are any chefs that Sarah is currently mentoring, or any up and coming. Well, we have a, a great team um, at Monteverde, and some new chefs joining the team. We actually have a transition piece happening now, so we have some. Um, New new chefs coming on, which is exciting. Um, you know, this question's always tough because I feel like there's so many great chefs that I want to support and empower, but I don't want them to feel like they were not like at that level already. Do you know what I mean? But um, Dominique Leach just came out with her amazing sausages. Uh, she made these like smoked Wagyu hot dogs. Y'all should all get them. They're at Mariano's and delicious. Um, and she and I worked together at Spiaggia and... She's now done an amazing job. She has a barbecue restaurant called Lexington, Belly, uh, Lexington Betty's and now has her own hot dog line, which is amazing, and she's crushing it. Love that. Um, yeah. I. Do you have interns, like kitchen interns? We do. We do. Nice. Yeah, we have, we have um, in fact, one, one intern... She hasn't accepted the position, but I'm trying to get her to accept a, a pretty big position with us finance, that's going to over kind of see some financial pieces of the kitchen. Nice. And it's a, a new way. I think when you're at seven years old, you have to think of how, you know, it's not just the new restaurant anymore. It's not the new shiny restaurant. And so, you know, way, ways that we try to do things to start now at seven years, I, I want to take a step back and say, okay, now how do we really want to set up the next generation, mm. you know, the next generation of team members? I like it. Nice. Any other questions? Anybody? Neighbor, to previous question. <laughs> Good question. Uh, Christina. Christina has a seven-year-old, and she's asking Chef Sarah what recipe they could cook together. That's simple, of course. We all want simple. But revelatory. So... Um, I would say I, I'm going to go with, with a with pasta, with the dry pasta, because I think it's something that you can always have in your pantry and and kind of I like to call it like cooler clean out, where I go in my fridge and get a little bits and pieces. Um, going to pestos again, 
the in the cookbook there's a rigatoni with a pea pesto and sausage and I'm actually gonna make that with um, some students for Kitchen Possible which is a great uh, organization here in Chicago also started by Katie Lohman she's amazing and we go and we cook with the kids and nice. they cook the dishes and it's so fun so I think something like that that doesn't have a lot of knife work to start that you can put you know you can have them pick Confirm herbs. Confirm you can boil water, Christina. Using like the food processor to make the pea pesto and then like learning how to, oh sorry, learning how to boil the pasta and then like make the sauce. I think to me that is like really at any level what is most important in a kitchen is learning how to build flavor in a pan and you know, you can track that to anything, you know, you could make scrambled eggs and, but start the pan with a little bit of something, you know, mushrooms or veggies. But I would say any of the dry pastas, I think are really fun. Fresh pastas are great for kids to really have like that opportunity that Play-Doh no, is no longer just Play-Doh. It's actually like a dough. So, um, that they can eat and the kids really love to make fresh pasta, but it's not as easy to do. So I would maybe start with a few simple dry pastas and then maybe graduate to some fresh pasta. Love it. Yeah. Good well, questions. I'm sorry, I have to give a shameless plug here. Um, we have a second podcast that we do called Cook Tracks and it's an audio recipe cook along and Sarah did a couple of them with us. so fun. So if you go on any podcast platform and look at her recipes, you can actually cook along in real time with her she says to like place the pan over medium heat and she's kind of like talking you through it. It's really fun. Um, anyhow, I digress. Um, all righty. You wrote a nice note to your mom, Trish, at the beginning of the book that said to my mom, Trish, the dish, thank you for your love and for teaching me as a young girl to follow my dreams and career. Do you have a message to future chefs who may be interested in a career in food? I would, I, I call it the close your eyes. And if you can't think of anything else you'd rather be doing, then you're ready to be a chef because that's the reality. <laughs> like you have to really be all in. I think it takes, I can't stop thinking about food. It is like a thing that is all day long and how to be better and how to cook differently. And what's not like, it doesn't turn off. And so uh, my advice would be to, really do some work finding the right mentor. I think Chris, if I didn't have him as a mentor and Missy and Chef Tony, those people make, make her, you know, made me who I am. Um, and so it's really important when I talk about staging and finding the kitchen that feels like it's going to be the right environment for you, because that's so key. It's like, becoming a toddler, you know, you're learning how to cook, you're learning how to cook professionally. And so you need to be in an environment that is one that will push you and, but also be nurturing and supportive. And, and so utilizing that. And then I would say, try to read as much as you can. I know those books, I don't, you know, <laughs> like, but there's so much behind the map and people and ingredients and stories and, you know, before you create something, I think you have to understand origins of dishes, not just say, I'm going to make this, like understand where it came from. And mm. that's um, something that I've kind of developed and I've called it follow your food. So I always say, follow your food. And I sign a book, I'll write follow your food, because I think it's like understanding who, like who's making it or even just why or what the idea behind that recipe is. Like, like a bolognese ragu. You're not just going to like, I'm just going to make bolognese. Well, let's learn where it, it's from or like why is there three meats and and yeah. those types of things. So I think it's, I, I like the history of cooking, of food. Love it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you to the graduate again. Thank you to Ford's Gin, the delicious gin that was in the high tea cocktail that you tried. Appreciate yes. you all coming out on Monday at five o'clock. Who knew? Thank you. Um, thanks again to Thank Chef Sarah you. Grunberg. Thank you. Hey, everyone. We hope you loved that live episode from Graduate Hotel in Evanston. Here's a sneak peek at their cocktail program and a little taste of what our guests were sipping that evening.
This is Eric Smith. He's the general manager of the Graduate Hotel at Evanston. And he's going to share a little bit more about the cocktail you're drinking, as well as the bar program here at the hotel. Yeah, so you're, you're here in our great homestead room lounge, which, uh, you know, we had Evanston come aboard in 2020. So it's a little almost three years old. Uh, and this program came to life actually less than three years, about six months ago with Bad Birdie, who's such a great uh, world renowned mixologist. And so she came in and she spent a whole week with us to really figure out not only what who we are as graduate and what we do in our college towns, but get to know what Evanston was, what our culture is, and kind of where it is to kind of really create it. So the strength that you're starting with right now is called high tea. Uh, and it's actually based off of a very floral citrus piece because a lot of people don't know that city of Evanston is called the city of trees. And so when you're here during the spring and summer when things are blooming, you see all of the trees, you see the flowers, which are great. Um, so this is really made with a gin base piece of it with uh, Baracatavia as well as uh, it's got dragon fruit green tea that's infused in it with orange bitters. And so we top it off with kind of a dried roses or flower on top of it to really give that significant piece to Evanston. And so that's a really great piece that she really got from kind of going around and getting to know our history and what it is. And so uh, we really enjoy kind of getting her to see that piece of it, see what Graduate Homestead Room is, which is really inspired by John Hughes themes. You know, John Hughes, he came here when he was in high school and really kind of got to know the North short area. So we do a lot of things that are breakfast club related or uh, Uncle Buck or anything that kind of really goes along with it. It gives us really, again, that local flair to it. And that's what we do here at Graduate Hotels is we come into a lot of great uh, college towns and we give it really the flair of what it is locally. And part of one of our values is stay local. And so we look at what's here and what really makes us who we are to really embrace the community. And Evanston's done a really great job with that. And so we've kind of really married Evanston and Northwestern together, uh, being a wildcat country here to kind of make sure that happens for it. That's it. <laughs> Eric makes my job real easy. <laughs> Thanks again to our friends at Graduate Hotel in Evanston, Ford's Gin, and Chef Sarah Gruenberg. Find her on Instagram at Chef Sarah Jane. That's C-H-E-F-S-A-R-A-H-J-A-Y-N-E or at MonteverdeChicago.com. To learn more about Southern Smoke, go to southernsmoke.org. We'll share a link to those websites in the episode notes and at beyondtheplatepodcast.com. Find me and keep up to date with this podcast across all social media at On Kathy's Plate or go to beyondtheplatepodcast.com. Beyond the Plate is on all the socials at BT Plate Podcast. This episode was produced by myself, along with Ian Cohen, Joel Yetten, and Sean Petrosian. Our digital media producer is Sarah McClellan Me. Our music has been composed by Goldford. Find him at iGoldford. And as always, a special shout out to my wife, Katie. If you do have a moment, we'd love and appreciate it if you could rate or review and subscribe to this podcast on your listening site of choice. Don't forget to join us next Wednesday for an episode of Beyond the Drink, our companion podcast of Beyond the Plate, brought to you by our friends at Ford's Gin. Thank you for listening to Beyond the Plate. I'm Cappy, and remember, there are never too many cooks in the kitchen.